Assalamu alaikum. My name is Chris Stevens, and I'm the new U.S. Ambassador to Libya. I had the honor to serve as the U.S. envoy to the Libyan opposition during the revolution, and I was thrilled to watch the Libyan people stand up and demand their rights. Now I'm excited to return to Libya to continue the great work we've started, building a solid partnership between the United States and Libya to help you, the Libyan people, achieve your goals. Right now, I'm in Washington, preparing for my assignment. As I walk around the monuments and memorials commemorating the courageous men and women who made America what it is, I'm reminded that we, too, went through challenging periods. When America was divided by a bitter civil war 150 years ago, President Abraham Lincoln had the vision and the courage to pull the nation together and help us move forward toward a shared goal of peace and prosperity. Growing up in California, I didn't know much about the Arab world. Then, after graduating from the University of California at Berkeley, I traveled to North Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer. I worked as an English teacher in a town in the High Atlas Mountains in Morocco for two years and quickly grew to love this part of the world. Since joining the Foreign Service, I've spent almost my entire career in the Middle East and North Africa. One of the things that impressed me when I was last in Libya was listening to stories from the people who are old enough to have traveled and studied in the United States back when we had closer relations. Those days are back. We had 1,700 Libyans apply for Fulbright grants to study in the United States this year, more than any country in the world. Now, we know that Libya is still recovering from an intense period of conflict. and There are many courageous Libyans who bear the scars of that battle. We're happy that we've been able to treat some of your war wounded at U.S. hospitals. We look forward to building partnerships between American and Libyan hospitals to help return Libya's health care system to the extraordinary standards of excellence it once enjoyed. Over my shoulder here, you can see the U.S. Capitol building. In that building, 535 elected representatives from every corner of America come together to debate the issues of the day. They are men and women from every religious, ethnic, and family background. I look forward to watching Libya develop equally strong institutions of government. Education and healthcare are just two of the many areas where I see opportunities for close partnership between the United States and Libya. I look forward to exploring those possibilities with you as we work together to build a free, democratic, prosperous Libya. See you soon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee. Today, I want to welcome you from the Bay Area, from all over the country, here to San Francisco's City Hall. Today, we honor and celebrate Ambassador John Christopher Stevens in this civic celebration of his life. I thank the Stevens family for hosting this celebration here amongst his many friends, his family, his colleagues from around the world who continue to remember and celebrate his, distinct, his distinguished life and the sacrifice he made for all of us. While we have lost a true hero to our nation, his accomplishments and generosity lives on in all of the places that he has served promoting mutual respect, understanding, and cooperation through international relationships. Ambassador Stevens is an inspiration to all of us. I did something personally today. I texted my daughters, who also grew up in the Bay Area. They've always reminded me that they love being San Franciscans, but now as young adults, they pride themselves in being world citizens. This is that place, San Francisco in the Bay Area, where we born our attitudes and evolve ourselves to be not only great San Franciscan and Bay Area citizens, the international status of our city and our Bay Area promote us to be world citizens. 
I am proud to be the mayor of a city that embraces peace, diversity, and is leading a nation in the world in advancing equity, acceptance, and tolerance. We will always be an international city that promotes peace in an effort to make our world a more inclusive place for all. Our city will always remember Ambassador Stevens as a hero who served all Americans, and we will always remember his vision and leadership. He simply made the world a better place for all of us. Thank you for being here today. I'm Ann Stevens, Chris's sister. This is Tom Stevens, Chris's brother. Where will we go? And Hillary, our little sister. We want to extend a, a warm welcome to the family, friends, and the many distinguished officials in attendance today. Thank you for being here. We are very honored by your presence. And thanks to Mayor Lee, thank you for allowing us to gather here. Um, and to the city's protocol and special events team, and the many organizations and individuals who have offered extraordinary assistance to our family during this difficult time. Our parents asked us to speak for the family to, to talk about growing up with Chris. Um, I think, overall, the greatest thing that we can appreciate about Chris is how much fun, how clever, how witty he was, how he made us all smile and laugh. And I can testify that Chris was a mis mischievous little guy from the very beginning, as I was usually the target of his pranks. He set my bassinet on fire with a magnifying mirror. <laughs> At four, he backed me up into a red-hot bathroom heater, resulting in a bottom burn in an ER visit in the middle of the night. At seven, he led me off the trail on my bicycle, shooting into Puta Creek in Davis. My nickname was Chubbs, or Woman. <laughs> Chris caused me a lot of trouble. So why do I miss him so much? Chris was a huge presence in our family. Though he lived far away, he had a lot of friends, he had a very challenging job, he always came home. And when he came home for Christmas, for our wedding, for Hillary's baby shower, he was really there. He wasn't text messaging, he wasn't emailing, he was running with us, playing tennis, eating, drinking, telling stories, and extracting our stories. His interest made us each feel very special. He believed in the value of every person's story. Once he visited me in Seattle, and I took him to visit an elderly friend in a nursing home. As we waited for the friend to come out, Chris started wandering in the halls, chatting up the other residents in their wheelchairs. Pretty soon he came back and he said, Ann, you have to meet this guy. He's a judge. He has the best history. It's so interesting. <laughs> we'd, we'd get into an elevator in a department store, and by the time we got off, he'd be chatting with the other writers in French. <laughs> Where did this come from? I think from our grandfather, Chief Stevens. Known for his wide-eyed optimism, Chief was a popular Grass Valley High School history teacher, very famous for telling stories and jokes. We would go to the grocery store or the coffee shop, and Chief would know everyone there and have a story and a, and a, and a joke for each person. Chris really took to this. And I can picture him in the markets of Cairo, joking with vendors, smiling, and enjoying their stories. Chris was Chief Stevens gone global. <laughs> but Chris was also a perfect amalgam of our father and mother. From our father, Chris inherited a deep appreciation for history, for reading all the newspapers, for the beauty of words, for great wit of Gilbert and Sullivan of P.G. Woodhouse and of nature. Like dad, Chris loved to experience the world through hiking, from Mount Tam to the Sierras and the Atlas Mountains to the Bavarian Alps. One summer during college, I had a job at Signal Mountain Lodge in the Grand Tetons, 
Chris came out to visit and started reading Hemingway's Nick Adams stories. Now is now is now is now. Inspired, he signed on for a job, and long after I went to school, Chris was still there, totally immersed in this culture, not only hiking, fishing, and camping, but hunting elk. Hard to believe. One of the last times I was with Chris, we took a long run through the trails of Walnut Creek. He was reading a book of how to, how to keep running as we enter our later years, giving me pep talks on how to drag myself out of bed in cold, dark mornings to take that run. I was inspired. From mom, Chris learned the value of understanding the culture when you visit a foreign country, the importance of talking to people in their own language. When Chris was a comfortable Piedmont high schooler playing tennis and drinking beer, sorry, <laughs> mom signed him up for the American Field Service. She thought he might be sent to Brazil to work in sugarcane fields or build latrines, a character building experience. But Chris, leading the charmed life, spent the summer polishing his Spanish and paella recipe over bonfires on a Bilbao beach. Chris learned Italian, French, and Arabic. He encouraged me to travel, to study in Germany, to learn French so I could communicate in Tunisia, to learn Spanish so I could speak directly with my patients. I saw the magic of the Middle East through Chris's wide, optimistic eyes. I remember walking into a restaurant in Cairo and the waiter saying something in Arabic to Chris. He chuckled and then translated, when you walk in, the whole room lights up. <laughs> Was that just Chris or the beauty of the Arab language or, or how perfectly they understood each other? So Chris incorporated the wonderful values of our parents and shared these with the world. What did Chris mean to me? He's always been with me. He was the first to see me stand up in my crib. I watched everything he did. He probably taught me to walk. He set the standards for our family really high. And he brought wonderful friends into our lives, friends who are like brothers and sisters to us now. Chris was my most important mentor, and he showed me how. So it's not important who your mother is only, and not just important who your father is, but it's very important who your big brother is. And we had the very best. The world needs a lot more big brothers like Chris Stevens. I am Tom Stevens. I am here to give you the little brother perspective. <laughs> and uh, two, two points. One is um, I'd like to uh, uh, comment somewhat on some of the early development of his diplomatic skills. You've heard a lot uh, in the past several weeks about why he was a good diplomat. I think there are some things you haven't heard yet that you might be interested in. And secondly, on a more serious note, how his personality um, and mentoring as my big brother uh, positively affected my life. Now, in, in a lot of the media reports, you hear you know, he's a man of the people, he's a great guy, he's peace and love, and all that's true. I'm not denying any of that. But um, there's a different skill set also required, and that is um, the power of subtle persuasion. And you have to be able, I think, to convince someone to do something that's not necessarily in that person's best interest, yet make that person think that he's doing something great. And so he developed those skills at a very early age, and I have some life examples for you. Now, he never once yelled at me. This is not, I'm not just saying this because it's Memorial Service. He never once, I never saw him yell at anybody. I never saw him hit anybody. Even though he was my big brother, he never hit me, not once. However, um, he was able to convince me somehow that uh, I had been insulted so egregiously and I should be so enraged that I should launch into a physical assault on him? No, 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 no. On her. <laughs> true. That was the power of subtle persuasion. And to this day, nobody can figure out what she allegedly did uh, to deserve those, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. But, uh, <laughs> but there's another example. There's a, there's a saying, uh, Mark Twain, clothes make the man. Uh, naked people have little or no influence on society. I'm sure we've all heard that. And thus, most people have a very strong inclination, proclivity to remain clothed while they're in public. Um, with, although in recent times, there's certain exceptions in nearby neighborhoods, but we don't need to 
get into that right now. However, such were the powers that he had of subtle persuasion that he convinced me as a five-year-old to do the following. Number one, remove my clothing. Number two, put on a ski mask. And number three, streak through the neighbor's uh, family room while they were all in there watching TV on a random <laughs> suburban uh, weeknight. Um, so the power of subtle persuasion indeed. But on a more serious uh, and less embarrassing note, uh, he was a relentlessly positive and hopeful person. Uh, the best was always yet to come. He was a golden guy who foresaw a golden future. And he was always very, very humble. And he taught me uh, over the years uh, to stay positive, uh, whether it be all life's big milestones, schools, uh, jobs, you know, it was always, you know, don't say it that way, you've got to think this way, because if you think that way, it'll happen. And um, that was his perspective. And, and, and one example of the most trivial things he stayed positive about is registration stickers or car decals. You know, you only get one shot at those things. They're, if you <laughs> stick it on there, if you mess it up, forget it. Um, and of course, I had messed it up. And so I was out there showing him the car and I was lamenting all this and he had to find something. He said, no, 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 you're, you're looking at this all wrong. You're looking at it wrong. You see, what this is is, uh, and he was, this one he was reaching, I think he was struggling, but he said, no, 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 it's, it's a sign of human frailty, you see? And so then I was suddenly proud of myself that I would be able to drive around and, um, and show off my human frailty to everybody. So <laughs> that's the kind of thing he was able to spin it around and make it positive. And finally, you know, he was, he was humble. He was uh, the epitome of that, of that saying that it's amazing how much can be accomplished when nobody cares who gets the credit. And he didn't. Uh, he had so many professional achievements, yet he never talked about them. Uh, he wanted, he cared about other people. And so I hope that you ask yourselves, um, what would the world be like uh, if only a fraction of its people uh, had the mindset and acted in the way that he did? Stay positive, be humble, do it right. And he definitely did it right. And in conclusion, you know, he was not an overly emotional person, and that extended to um, the way that he said goodbye. He was calm and steady. And um, it was always just shake hands, see you next time, no matter where he was going, when he would come back. And um, that's w the way we left it in May of this year, the last time I saw him. And so now that it is time to say goodbye, I don't see any reason to deviate from that custom. So my big brother, my best friend, I'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Hillary Stevens, or as my family calls me, H.I. I was born when Chris was 20 years old. My first memories of Chris were also not related to uh, diplomacy. As a toddler, he would send me on missions, of which I was a willing accomplice. He sent me to stick carrots up my younger brother's nose as he slept in on Christmas morning. <laughs> that was really fun. Growing up, I was always able to brag that I had a brother in a foreign country, and I got to visit him in these places. We rode camels around pyramids in Egypt, bathed in hammams in Tunisia, snorkeled in the Sinai, and danced in Israeli discotheques. In Libya, I played tennis with the daughter of his Libyan tennis coach, learned about medical school in Libya, and jogged through the ruins of Leptis Magna. But, as they said, Chris always came home and entertained us when he did. I worked hard to sharpen my tennis and uh, skiing skills to impress him. I was very proud the year Chris said, you ski faster than the master. <laughs> we got up early on holidays to be the first ones on the ski lift. At my wedding, he said he would be happy to perform a Libyan Bedou liberation dance to celebrate the success of the revolution. He inspired me uh, to travel and work internationally. I filled out an application for the Peace Corps uh, during my senior year at Wellesley because Chris had been in the Peace Corps. 
He taught English in a village in Morocco, and I taught math in a village in Burkina Faso. We talked about the joys of living and working overseas. We spoke French together. Later, he helped me get an assignment with a pediatric AIDS group in Burkina Faso. Now, I work in a county hospital in Stockton caring for patients from all over the world. Like Chris, I am genuinely interested in listening to their stories and learning about their lives. I was really hoping that he would still be here. I dreamt of someday working as a doctor in a country where he was ambassador. I was looking forward to showing off my growing new family. Our daughter was born in April, and Chris got to hold her before leaving for his post in Libya. As our father said best uh, at 5 a.m. on September 12th, he made it to the top, he tried his best, he was a great brother, and I couldn't agree more.
Good afternoon. I'm Steve McDonald. Uh, Chris and I have been friends since we both pledged the ATO fraternity at UC Berkeley in 1978. I want to first thank Chris's family for allowing me the honor of speaking today as we celebrate Chris's amazing life. And I look at this crowd and I try to figure out how is it that Chris achieved so much success in his life and career while managing to make personal and professional connections and lifelong friends all over the world. This beautiful light-filled rotunda is the perfect setting to celebrate Chris's life because he was a true Renaissance man and offered a lesson in modern day enlightenment to all that he met. Some say don't sweat the small stuff, but I think Chris was successful because he did pay attention to the little details and common courtesies that showed the world that he cared. I think the roots of Chris's enlightening character were evident back when we were undergrads at Cal. And I'd like to share some examples. <clears throat> First of all, we'll start superficially on the topic of fashion. <clears throat> Chris, like many of our pledge class, was from Piedmont. And I recall thinking, what's with all these guys from Piedmont? What's with the khakis and the penny loafers and the button-down shirts? Chris lived in the room across from mine, and it seemed that he had adopted this as his uniform. But in hindsight, I can see now that he was offering his own form of enlightenment even then. He was, guarding, he was guiding us away from that dark time known as the disco era. <laughs> and who knew that Chris would work his timeless style for the next 34 years? And look at the effect he had on me. Who's wearing the button down now? That was my first life lesson from Chris. Stick with the classics. They won't go out of style. That said, my wife has gently advised me that the definition of a classic look does not extend to certain flannel shirts from 1982. <laughs> Our next topic on the lessons that we learned from Chris back then involved culture. And this is beyond the stereotypical fraternity life experience because I was lucky enough to live with Chris and another famous Piedmonter, Austin Titchener, in a room that was known as the Triple. Talk about enlightening. Chris promptly dubbed our large room the Triple Occupancy Club. And little did I know that rooming with these high school friends came with the added bonus of an extracurricular education in the arts. Chris arrived with his stack of LPs, many courtesy of his stepdad, Bob Commande, the Chronicle music critic at the time. And Austin contributed his eclectic collection of musical theater and comedy recordings and, well, himself. And those of you that know Austin know that nothing more need be said. Balancing out that urbane cultural scene, Chris invited me on a trip to Grass Valley to visit his grandfather, where we got to do a little gold panning from the virgin load of dirt that was under the basement. It was a lesson in living history of the Stevens family. And I'll never forget what a great experience it was to live with those two guys. Moving on to Chris's study habits at Cal, everyone knew how brilliant Chris was and how he demonstrated an intelligence in a truly enlightened manner. Chris was probably usually the smartest guy in the room, but he never comported himself that way. He was confident and outgoing. He was never arrogant. He was always self-effacing and always quick with a laugh or a grin and always looking for ways to learn something from everyone else around him. It was no surprise considering Chris came from such good stock. Chris studied Western civilizations and he immersed himself in the cultures and the languages that he studied. And he took multiple trips to study abroad in Spain and Italy and Morocco. And perhaps most importantly, Chris knew how to relax and enjoy the moment. And when I would per periodically freak out about my coursework or some other problem I thought I had, he would make me stop and take a break, maybe go play a, back, a game of backgammon on the balcony, and enjoy the view. It was another early lesson in the zen-like mindfulness of Chris. No wonder he excelled in such a challenging and stressful career. But I don't want you to think that Chris was perfect. After extensive research, we came up with at least one or two blemishes on his record, sort of. And in the interest of time, I'm leaving out the references to inappropriate limericks about philosophers. The only time I ever saw Chris lose his temper was when we were sharing a double room in our last year. And some of our 
less enlightened brethren decided to make a bunch of noise late at night during finals week. When yelling at these guys didn't do the trick, Chris burst out of bed, he ran out onto the balcony, he grabbed a water fire extinguisher, and he let him have it. He seemed much less angry when he came back into the room, and he was particularly pleased when the guys that he drenched came running up the stairs yelling my name. I have to say that Ambassador Stevens did not bother to correct the record as to who was responsible. And I feel this is a rare example of a failed diplomatic effort on his part. <laughs> he did seem to sleep remarkably well after that, however. Another topic that I think is apropos when we're talking about Chris is his relationship to material things. It seemed to me that he didn't really care about things, except maybe to the extent that they were a means to an end, providing access to people and places and the cultures and activities that he wanted to participate in. And I wanted to mention a couple of examples from the UC Berkeley archives in that regard. Uh, his typewriter. Chris arrived at Cal with a beautiful, fancy electric typewriter, which was a coveted object in that pre-laptop and pre-PC era. Chris decided that that beautiful machine was too bulky to carry around and he didn't like being tethered to an electrical outlet. So one day he traded it for a little Olivetti manual typewriter. And he was so proud of that little machine. He loved the tactile sense of clacking away at that thing, which he did very well. He created some great works with that little typewriter. The next topic I want to talk about are shoes. As enlightened members of the ATO fraternity, our class came up with an idea to have a great Gatsby party every year. And this was a major event where we had live bands and a speakeasy in the basement. We had a pond with a waterfall in the back. We even had a duck. Chris wanted to dress the part, and he was delighted to find a snazzy pair of gaudy black and white wingtips at a thrift store, which fit the bill. And he seemed undeterred by the fact that these were golf spikes. <laughs> and that even after I mentioned to him that he would literally be cutting a rug if he wore those things. <laughs> he bought them anyway, and he just unscrewed the spikes and danced up a storm. And those floors needed refinishing anyway. Next, let's talk about coffee. Chris was one of the first people I knew in that pre-Starbucks era who bought coffee beans and ground them himself. He bought a little coffee maker and he set it up in our room. He insisted that this was better than the rot gut that we could get down in the kitchen downstairs. I had to admit he was right. And it was another example of Chris showing me how to live in the moment. I laughed when I read Senator McCain's recent remarks, recalling when Chris insisted on personally brewing the senator a proper cup of cappuccino during their meetings in Libya. Uh, the next topic of material goods would be Chris's donkey, or lack thereof. I love the picture of Chris riding the donkey on his website, and it reminded me of a priceless letter that he sent to me when I was in law school, when he was over there in the Peace Corps. Chris wrote wonderful notes describing his experiences, and in this instance, he told us of a time when he went running near the village where he was staying, only to have some locals run up alongside of him and ask, where is it? Where did it go? Where's what? Your donkey, where did it go? I don't have a donkey. Why are you running? <laughs> For exercise. Exercise? Are you nuts? If you want exercise, come work on my orchard, you crazy American. <laughs> Chris succeeded because he knew how to laugh at himself and how to relate to people around him. There's two more memories I want to share. One deals with government and jazz. Chris always wanted to work for the State Department. He always wanted to be involved in the Foreign Service. He first took the Foreign Service exam when we were undergrads at Cal. And he came back that first time and he was pleased with the results on his written exam, but he felt he didn't do so well on the orals. The question that seemed to trip him up and left him perplexed was the following. Mr. Stevens, please compare American government and jazz music. Chris told us he didn't quite know how to handle that question. And my suggestion that maybe both forms involve people blowing loudly on their horn or banging on a drum was not terribly helpful. We decided we must, we decided they must ask questions like that just to see if they could trip up the applicant. 
Well, we didn't have the internet to find a quick answer, but we eventually figured it out. And even though Chris may not have come up with the answer during that exam, he certainly lived the message taught by this interesting comparison. Both American democracy and jazz music involve ongoing experimentation. They both involve unscripted action and improvisation as we figure out the best way to get along. Both depend on a group allowing a soloist or representative to step forward and recite his piece, while the rest of the group provides background harmony and rhythm. And when both forms work, the world is treated to a remarkable result where ad hoc and seemingly dissonant voices become greater than the sum of their parts, and beautiful music, literally and figuratively, ensues. We all know the amazing things Chris achieved when he led the way as America collaborated with the Libyan people and our allies to help them move forward towards greater freedom and a representative form of government. The Middle East, and especially Libya, was Chris's bandstand. He knew that all the members gained through collaboration and cultural exchange. And on a personal note, I just wanted to share one last memory. Our daughter Maggie was born in 1994 with profound life-threatening problems, and she required many surgeries and long hospitalizations during the first few years. The Chronicle ran a story about Maggie in 1996, and Chris's mom, Mary, cut out that article and sent it to Chris while he was posted in Cairo. Chris took the time from his busy duties to write a thoughtful note to us expressing his concern and wishing us well and even commenting on how cute Maggie was. And he closed that note as follows. As they say in this part of the world, and you'll forgive me for butchering the Arabic, Rabina ya sahel, may Allah make things easier for you. And this is my wish for Chris's family and friends today as we mourn his loss. The world will never, the world never saw a kinder, more resolute and enlightened soul than Chris Stevens. His integrity and character, his empathy, his courage, his tolerance were ever present, unchanging, even with all of his success and fame and in the face of every challenge. We feel so sad to have lost Chris, but so lucky to have known him. We will do everything we can to make sure his memory lives on and to foster and support the kind of people-first diplomacy that he stood for and advocated, both at home and abroad. VTL Chris and Ravina Yasahel, my old friend.
My name is Mary Neumeyer. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C., but I first met Chris 26 years ago at Hastings Law School, just two blocks from here. We were in the same section in the same study group, and when we finished law school, we both went to the East Coast to work for large law firms. Over the years, we stayed in close touch, and when Chris was back from overseas, we were frequent tennis partners and would also get together for dinners and other events in Washington. Over the years, our families became friends as well, and it has been such a pleasure to come to know them and Chris's many friends in Washington and to watch his career unfold. We met on the first day of school. I sat down next in our civil procedure class next to a person who turned out to be named Chris Hyland, and shortly thereafter, Chris Stevens sat down next to me. The three of us went to lunch afterwards and became friends from that day forward. Chris never tried to be someone special, but he was someone special. When we were at Hastings, his charm and his wit were on display from the start. In class, he was very articulate, and he seemed, as later in life, always very poised and well-spoken and at ease. I think that our professors loved him. He liked being a student, uh, which I know was true even when he was studying at the National War College just a few years ago. He always seemed to, be gen to genuinely enjoy studying and debating and was immersed in classes and activities at the school, particularly the Hastings Law Journal, where he became managing editor. He very much liked the art of argument and trial law, and he used to go to the courts nearby to watch very high-profile trials and the legendary judges and litigators. Well, he spent lots of time on the Hastings campus, whether in the library or out on what is called the beach in front of the school. He also liked to get off campus and would often go for a run across Golden Gate Bridge or to play racquetball or to play tennis on Russian Hill. At Hastings, there were a number of things that made him stand out. First, it was very clear that he already had a strong desire to work in the international arena and particularly in the Middle East. He often spoke about his time in Morocco. He had already started the process of applying for the Foreign Service. And he was also reading books about American diplomats. And I still remember him reading the memoirs of George Kennan, one of our most famous diplomats, and being fascinated by his life. He was also taking international and comparative law classes and regularly reading publications like Foreign Affairs magazine. As a summer associate in the Washington office of Pillsbury Madison Sutro, uh, he somehow was tasked to go up to Yale Law School and talk about his experiences in the Middle East. His mother said she received a postcard from Chris saying, hi everybody, I'm here at, Le at Yale Law School giving a lecture on Moroccan carpet law. <laughs> a second trait about Chris was how much he loved his family in Grass Valley and Nevada City. His grandmother, an artist, had a number of paintings on display at the Old Mint here in San Francisco. Uh, they reflected scenes from that part of California, and he took us down there and proudly showed us his, her work. Although he traveled the world, his family was always in his thoughts, and California was always his home. Finally, what I will most remember about Chris was how thoughtful he was and how people were drawn to him. Chancellor Wu of Hastings wrote recently that when Chris was appointed ambassador, numerous classmates of his, friends and professional acquaintances contacted me to encourage me to reach out to him. He was so well thought of. I sent a handwritten card, and to my surprise, he returned the correspondence with his own handwritten note. That would be very much like Chris. He appreciated and enjoyed interactions with people. In fact, our friend Chris Hyland put it very eloquently when he said, Chris was the finest among us. More than his obvious brains and manifest charm, he was a man of both substance and humility. At parties, dinners, and gatherings, he spent little time talking about himself and his accomplishments, and really only when he was forced to. Instead, he asked people about their lives, their views, their accomplishments. He always focused on other people rather than himself. 
This was true of him and it never changed, and I believe was central to his success in Washington and ultimately around the world. For all of us who came to know him, it was such a pleasure and a privilege. Uh, my name is Ali Ojali. I am the Libyan ambassador before and after the revolution. Well, on behalf of the Libyan government, the Libyan people, I want to say to Chris' family, parents, brothers, sisters, and to the American people, we are very sorry. You send us one of your best diplomats, but unfortunately, we will not be able to protect him. It is a sad story to tell. I knew Chris Stephen when I came to this country in 2004. I think I met him for the first time in 2007, before he went to Libya, when he was serving at the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. And I met him a few times in Libya when I used to go from time to time. He's the man, there is no limit for his contacts with the Libyan people. He's the man who witnessed the Libyan suffering during the dictatorship of Ajib Gaddafi. And he's the man also, he saw the brutality of Gaddafi's killing his own people using all kinds of weapons. He was the first American representative to go to Benghazi, my hometown. Every member of the Libyan delegation came to this country. When I speak about Stephen, they said, oh, yes, Chris, we know him. He talked to the people, he meet with the people, he knows their, their suffering. And the main thing, that he trusts them. And when they raised against Gaddafi, he support them. Chris, it is a great loss for Libya. We lost him as a friend, we lost him as a, as a man who understands the history of the Libyan people before and after. Chris, he built the bridge between Libya and the United States, strong bridge of love, of hope. Libyan people, they were desperate. We never believed that one day that we would be able to raise against this dictatorship. I knew Chris after he came back to, uh, to, from his post uh, more, because we, he comes to the house sometimes during the weekends, and we go, we play tennis in, in McLean. And after the tennis, we came back home and we have some Libyan breakfast. Uh, he's the man of principles and he's, and he's serious. And I do agree, he never speak about himself, what achievement he made. Uh, he's the guy, when you see him once, then you look for him again. This is kind of diplomat. I remember one time he told me a story that uh, when he was serving in, in Tripoli, and then when he went to visit Benghazi. He told me when he arrived in Benghazi, walking in the streets of Benghazi, then he looks his back behind him, and he see two people following him all the way. Wherever he goes, then they follow him. And then he stopped, and he uh, went direct to them, and he told them, hello, how are you? Uh, yeah, they speak with him some words, and they invite them for coffee. These people, of course, they are intelligent service, uh, maybe not to protect him in the first place, but to see what he is doing, what he is context. You see, this is the kind of diplomats which we really need in this world. He didn't go to the Minister of Foreign Affairs to protest why you're following me wherever I go. No, he gained friends, and they became friends. Now, this is Chris Stephen. Um, I really cry for my family and uh, with my family for Chris when they hear this news. Uh, and we lost a friend, we lost a supporter, and we lost a hero. Chris Steven is a hero, and he is part of the Libyan history. He is part of the Libyan revolution. His name will never forget, will never for, will never forget him. And I'm sure that uh, uh, his name and his achievement in the Libyan uh, in the Libyan revolution, that will be part of the Libyan history. And we, again, sorry 
that we cannot protect this professional diplomat who came to help us in a very critical time when we're looking for, for friends and for support and for help. Now it is time of peace, but we still need the support of friends of, uh, who support us during the war. Libya is still facing a very critical challenge. But the same day, Chris Stephen, it is the same day when the Libyan parliament, for the first time in the Libyan history in 42 years, that they elect their, their first prime minister. Thank you for, for the United States for your support. And again, we are sorry on behalf of the Libyan people for the loss of this great friend. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am Barbara Lee. I represent the 9th Congressional District of California, which includes Piedmont and Berkeley, where Ambassador Stevens spent many of his formative years. To the family and friends of our beloved Ambassador Stevens, to Mayor Lee, to Senator Feinstein, Representatives Miller and Speer, to Adjour Attorney General Harris, ambassadors, government officials, past and present, my friends. Let me first just express my sincerest condolences to Ambassador Stevens' family, friends, and colleagues in the face of your tremendous loss. Ambassador Stevens and the others who lost their lives in Libya worked each and every day to advance the highest ideals of this great nation. They will never be forgotten. Ambassador Stevens, in spite of the many challenges of seeking global peace and security, he truly believed that peace is possible. Representatives George Miller and Jackie Spear both are with us today, and our entire Northern California delegation had the solemn honor of entering into the permanent congressional record, the life, service, and legacy of Ambassador Stevens. Additionally, a flag has been flown over the Capitol by Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi, represented today by her daughter Christine Pelosi. This flag has been presented to the family in celebration of Ambassador Stevens' life and in honor of his tremendous legacy. As I mentioned, uh, we entered into the congressional record our testimony honoring the life of Ambassador John Christopher Stevens. In the interest of time, I won't read the entire congressional record, but only an ex excerpt, excuse me. I said, Mr. Speaker, I rise today with my colleagues to honor, celebrate, and remember Ambassador John Christopher Chris Stevens. A son of Northern California and the Bay Area, Ambassador Stevens tragically lost his life in the greatest service to his country, selflessly and courageously representing American values in a foreign nation he knew intimately and cared for deeply. In his diplomatic capacity, Ambassador Stevens brought a profound and prolific knowledge of the Arab world and the Middle East to his assignment. His exemplary gift for making personal connections was invaluable, as his role first as special representative and later ambassador to one of the most complex and challenging regions of the world. Therefore, as we join in recognizing Ambassador Stevens amidst a sober outpouring of praise from his family, colleagues, fellow Americans, and the leaders of this nation, we remember also that Chris Stevens was beloved by many Libyans as well. Therefore, on, the residents, on behalf of the residents of Northern California and our entire state, we join President Barack Obama, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi, 
and an expansive global network of people in saluting Ambassador John Christopher Stevens. Ambassador Chris Stevens will be remembered for his strong sense of dignity, his humility, and his generous service to others. He will be truly missed by all who loved him and by all he served throughout the magnitude of his life's work. Thank you for this honor. Members of Christopher Stevens' family, ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank Chris Stevens' brother and sisters for their warm and delightful insights into what he was really like. Thank you so much. That was fantastic that you did for us. Christopher Stevens was obviously an extraordinary human being and contributor. Every year down at Stanford, we have a group of, we call them National Security Fellows come. And they're roughly the colonel level from Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and State Department. And a couple of weeks ago, we had a meeting and the first person that I called on was an Army colonel and I said, where were you last? And he said, in Libya. I said, did you know Christopher Stevens? He said, everybody knew Christopher Stevens. He was our leader. He was fluent in Arabic. He was constructive. He was positive. He was doing something. He was our leader. This spontaneous, practically eruption from him. He was a Foreign Service officer. And anybody who has served with the Foreign Service, as I did with Secret as Secretary of State, knows what a very special group of people this is. They're very able people, dedicated. They work hard for our country. And Christopher Stevens, obviously, in an extraordinary group, was extraordinary. He stood out. I thought to myself, what image could I think of that might express our way of thinking about him? And I thought of the great seal of our republic. I don't know how many of you have ever looked carefully at it. The center of it is an eagle. And in one talon, the eagle is holding an olive branch. The eagle is looking at the olive branch to show that the United States will always seek peace. In the other talon, the eagle is holding arrows to show that the United States understands that if you're going to be effective and successful in seeking peace, you must be strong. Now let me expand on that image because it isn't only peace that we seek. We seek a better humankind. We seek the elimination of poverty. We seek better lives all over the world for ourselves and other people. And the arrows don't stand just for military strength. They stand for capability. They stand for the idea that the United States will try to recruit the best and most capable to apply themselves to those grand objectives. And as I have studied and thought about, and learned about the life of Christopher Stevens, he embodied that capability. And he sought those grand objectives that our democracy stands for. We gather here to mourn his loss and to demonstrate to his family how much we understand their grief. But we also gather to celebrate the immense accomplishments 
that this man has made for us. I picked out of my closet this morning a tie and says on it, democracy is not a spectator sport. So Christopher Stevens was a participant, a full, strong, effective participant in his beloved democracy. Chris, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Pickering. Chris Stevens was a friend and a colleague. But more than that, he was among the very best our Foreign Service has to offer in support of our people and our country. A man destined for even greater challenges and successes. It's a special honor for me to be asked to be here and to say a few words at this service in his memory. I must begin by offering my sincere condolences and feelings of compassion to his family and friends gathered here this afternoon to honor his memory. In truth, what we say here today, our words, can only be a pale shadow of his service and sacrifice for his nation and people, and indeed that of his colleagues, Glenn Doherty, Sean Smith, and Tyrone Woods. And I know you all join me in honoring and appreciating their service and devotion as well. Chris and I worked together for a time almost a dozen years ago. He was even then fully committed to his work, an authority already on the Middle East, a fine student of Arabic, but much more. He gave me careful and cogent advice and counsel as we wrestled together with the many growing problems that even back then were endemic to this troubled region. I was more than pleased and proud of Chris as I learned about his work in spearheading our country's efforts in opening up Benghazi as the critical changes in Libya began to unfold. His leadership there at a time of great importance and danger was a tribute to his courage and bravery, his skill and dedication as a diplomat, and to his commitment to a new and better Libya. Benghazi, in a real sense, as you have heard today, became his city. And it is with a deep sense of fate that it should be in Benghazi where he and his colleagues gave that last full measure of devotion for their country, our people, and his many friends friends in the city where he died, continuing to defend and prosper their hopes and their aspirations for the future. Many have commented since on Chris's salient commitment to the people of Benghazi. John Thorne, writing in the Christian Science Monitor, noted that when he passed in the street, the young men would call out, hello, Chris. They knew his face and would laugh and say hello always. This is the right way to deal with our people, they said. Libyan friends said he was always ready to put his country first. He shone as an advocate for America, in large part by being himself friendly, modest, and interested in the lives of ordinary people. His death was met with shock and sadness in Libya. Feelings with regard to Americans that are rare in that part of the world these days. But for me, that judgment captures key characteristics of Chris and his approach to life and work. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton noted that Chris is swearing in as ambassador to Libya. On an earlier tour at the Tripoli Embassy, he was visiting Roman ruins in Cyrene, one of the tourist sites in Libya. He was being trailed by Qadhafi security men who were obviously very intimidating to other tourists. 
As she recounted it, he reached over uh, to one of the men, stole his camera out of his hands, and started taking pictures of the men who had been following him. They were so dumbfounded that they had to laugh. And after a quick conversation, Chris convinced them to stand down. From a colleague at the embassy in Tripoli, I learned that Chris had a low-key, very humble style of diplomacy that Libyans really responded to after he became ambassador and returned to Tripoli. The embassy had posted a photo of him ordering a juice in a cafe. That went viral because Libyans were amazed at the sight of a senior government official doing mundane activities without a huge entourage and demanding VIP treatment. Chris had a great knowledge of Libyan history and culture. He would often crack jokes with government counterparts, not just in Arabic, but in the Libyan dialect, which the Libyans loved to hear him speak. And another told me that when I saw him again in May, this time as newly appointed ambassador in Tripoli, he had not changed a bit despite the promotion and accolades. He was still the same collegial, approachable guy. Lingering one night after dinner to help me with a difficult cable, I referred to him as Sir or Ambassador. He looked at me for a second, he sighed, and he said, I wish everyone would just call me Chris. He loved the work, he loved the people, but he never took himself too seriously. And a third friend said that people talk about what a good diplomat he was, but he knew how to motivate others to be the same. Even those who felt down on their careers, who had lost faith that it was worth the hardship. This is truly a tough task to inspire others to serve with dignity and self-respect. Chris knew just how to do that. Nothing we can say here can make up for the heartache and pain which his loss brings to his family. We can only share that as we share in our compassion and concern for a lost friend and colleague. We hope that family members in particular will draw solace and strength in our coming together around his life and service in a joyful as well as indeed a way which shows how deeply we miss Chris. I still have Chris's last message to me on my email. He wrote, hello Tom, it's exciting times in Tripoli with election now and a new Congress coming together. As I read Libya's recent history, it's a bit like we're reliving the post-World War II years. How right he was. That was Chris, always thinking, always sharp, always ready. Public service is too often looked down upon by some in this country. And often my colleagues in the Foreign Service lament that they don't make them the way they used to anymore. Today we remember a man, Chris Stevens, whose life and service just proves how wrong my colleagues really are. Chris shows, it, that they, shows us that they still make them the way they used to, only an awful lot better. Thank you. Chris's family would like to invite everyone to a reception after our ceremony, and the reception will be held right over there, and you're all welcome. Let us pray. O oh Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. And may the author of all life bless us and keep us. In God's name we pray, amen.